Let us pray. Gracious Lord and Heavenly Father, we thank you for Jesus, our Redeemer and Savior. And on this day when we remember that he will also one day be our judge, let us take refuge in the Holy Gospel of the forgiveness of our sins. And let us rejoice in that so that we may not be ashamed on the judgment day, uh, but rather be exalted into the kingdom of glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, Matthew 22. Matthew 22. Last week we began to talk about Holy Week, uh, and we had the triumphal entry into Jerusalem, and uh, then we had the, uh, the parable of the uh, householder's vineyard, and uh, when we got to the end of chapter 21, we learned that the Pharisees and the scribes and the chief priests were uh, trying to put hands on Jesus and to take him away, but they couldn't yet do so because they feared the multitude, all right? The, the, people's, uh, the people's irritation at them uh, was quickly flared. So now in chapter 22, now what we're seeing here is that the clash between Jesus and these religious leaders who oppose him and who are, remember this, you always have to keep this in your mind, they are plotting to murder him, all right? Uh, this, this is the thing that a lot of, you know, when you're reading the Bible, sometimes, you know, you get into this whole thing of you know, historical never-never um, uh, land thinking, you know, that once upon a time, something happened. It wasn't like real life in this world, no. The Pharisees and the Sadducees were trying to have Jesus murdered. They wanted him dead, all right? And Jesus knows this, and now that the time has come for him to give his life as a ransom for many, Jesus is more openly uh, opposed to them as well. So that's where we begin in chapter 22. Jesus answered and spake unto them again by parables. Now they were already offended by the previous parable. All right? He spoke again by parables and said, The kingdom of heaven is like unto a certain king which made a marriage for his son. The king, of course, is God the Father. The son is Christ. All right? And the marriage is the atonement. All right, the salvation promised in the Old Testament, fulfilled in Christ, and now offered to all through the church's preaching of the gospel. All right, this is the marriage of the king's son. He sent forth his servants. The servants are the Old Testament prophets, Jesus, the apostles, and all preachers and Christians who spread the gospel either by their own mouths or by supporting the mouth of, a, of the preacher. All right? So the servants are the, the messengers of God. And he sent forth his servants to call them that were bidden to the wedding. The ones who were bidden to the wedding, the ones who were invited, were the Jews in the Old Testament. They were the invited guests. All of the promises in the Old Testament are repeat invitations to get in on this marriage of the king's son, this coming kingdom of God. And they would not come. This is the story of the entire Old Testament. The stiff-necked people would not, would not, would not, right? Kept falling into sin. Read the book of Judges. Read the prophets very carefully and see how God stretched out his hands, patiently beckoning a people who perpetually rejected him. But when you do that, don't look down your nose because that's exactly what we do. 
That's what we do apart from the grace and mercy of God. So uh, they would not come. Again, for, he sent forth other servants, saying, Tell them which are bidden, Behold, I have prepared my dinner, my oxen and my fatlings are killed, and all things are ready. Come unto the marriage. So this is the preaching of the gospel by Jesus, the fulfillment. Everything is now ready. This is the gospel. The gospel is about the finished work of Christ. Your redemption, the atonement that sets you free from sin and brings you back to God has already been accomplished. And what you do is simply receive the finished work and believe it. All right? You, be you receive it and you believe it. All right? And uh, so this is the preaching of the gospel, the finished work of Christ. All things are now ready. There's nothing you have to do. Just come. Lay down the burden of your sin and your rebellion and come to Jesus. But they made light of it. They thought it was ridiculous. They went their ways, one to his farm and, one, and another to his merchandise. They, they preferred the things of this world to the things of God and the things of the Spirit. And the remnant took his servants and entreated them spitefully and slew them. Right? So others were not content to just make light of the kingdom of God and ignore it, but they opposed it. They intentionally oppose and mistreat it. Right? And, and, and that is even worse. It is one thing to not be interested in the kingdom of God. It's another level of wickedness when you begin to stand against it and oppose it. All right, so the remnant took his servants and entreated them spitefully and slew them. And this is the history of the book of Acts. When you read the, uh, the book of Acts, you see that the early Christian church was constantly being persecuted by the unbelieving Jews that they were preaching the gospel to. All right? And, uh, but when the king heard thereof, he was wroth, and he sent forth his armies and destroyed those murderers and burned up their city. All right, so this is the destruction of Jerusalem, which Jesus prophesied numerous times uh, in, in his earthly ministry. Numerous times he prophesied the coming destruction of Jerusalem because of their unbelief and their opposition to God's will and work in Christ. Verse 8. Then he said to his servants, The wedding is ready, but they which were bidden, the invited guests, are not worthy. Go ye therefore. Notice those words, go ye therefore. You see them again in Matthew 28, 19, when Jesus says to the eleven apostles, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them uh, in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Here you see those words again. Go ye therefore into the highways, and as many as ye shall find, bid to the marriage. So the servants went out, and this is the apostles in the book of Acts, and, and other preachers throughout the ages, who go out and bring people into the kingdom as the gospel is preached. And they, brought, and they gathered together all as many as they found, both bad and good, and the wedding was furnished with guests. All right, so this is a picture of the church. People who never dreamed they'd be included in God's kingdom and people who don't deserve to be included in God's kingdom are included in God's kingdom because God's kingdom is a kingdom of grace. And everyone who will repent of their sins and believe and trust in Jesus Christ is welcome in the kingdom of grace. All right, and so you see the church preaching the gospel in the world, and in every generation, there are people coming into it 
and enjoying the benefits of it. And then there are people who harden themselves, harden their hearts, prefer something else, think something else is better, and they, and they destroy their own souls by their own fault. All right. So uh, the wedding was furnished with guests. And when the king came in to see the guests, he saw there a man which had not on a wedding garment. Right, here is a picture of a person who wants to be among the children of God, who wants to be considered a believing Christian, but a person who has no faith in their hearts. All right? They, they, they are faking it for whatever reason one would fake it. Goodness knows why anybody would want to fake a thing like this, but people have all kinds of motives for the things that they do. And there are people who feel it necessary to fake being Christians. They don't really believe in Jesus. They don't really believe in the forgiveness of sins. They don't really believe in everlasting life or that the Bible is the very true word of God. But they want to seem as if they do. And so they want to be among the children of God. And yet they have no faith. They are not clothed in the righteousness of Christ. Right? In some way that's not apparent to the rest of the congregation, they are living in some kind of sin, or at very least, they are living in unbelief and impenitence. So this guy doesn't have a wedding garment on, and, he, and what he's doing, it offends God, and it, it, it is an offense to the very angels of God, all right, that this man would place himself in a position that is not rightfully his that imagine coming to a coming to a wedding in which garments are provided for all the guests and you see somebody come into the wedding without a wedding garment on you know and all all of the people who are wearing the wedding garments and all of the people who have provided the wedding garments look at this person go what in the world is this person up to not wearing a wedding garment? It's an offense, all right? It's an intentional offense. And uh, so the king says to him, Friend, how camest thou in hither uh, not having on a wedding garment? When this person is confronted with their offensive activity, he's shocked into speechlessness. All right? he, he was speechless. Why? Because there's no excuse for that kind of behavior. All right? better, to, better to absent yourself forever from something than to insert yourself into it but not go along with the rules of the game. All right? uh, you know, one of the things that we deal with in modern America in the church is that Americans are really mentally all the time consumers, right? We're consumers, and, and, and being consumers, we think that we are the specialty and that all the places that we consume, including church, has to do it our way, right? Now, in McDonald's, it may be true, have it your way. In Burger King, it may be true, have it your way. But in the church, it's have it Christ's way. And when a person refuses to wear a wedding garment and yet wants to insert themselves among the brethren, this is an offense. And when he is called on it, he is speechless. And then said the king to his servants, Bind him hand and foot and take him away and cast him into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So here in this we see 
God's wrath and judgment coming upon a persistently impenitent and unbelieving person. All right? It will be delayed for many, but it will come when we persist in unbelief, when we are so un impenitent and unbelieving that we would dare to approach Christ without a wedding garment, that is, without being clothed in his forgiveness and righteousness. It's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of, of the living God. So, once again, most of the fiercest things in the New Testament about the danger of eternal damnation come out of the mouth of Jesus. All right? You know, Jesus is often pictured in modern society as this really soft, really nice dude. You know what I'm saying? Uh, Jesus is, you know, he is that soft, just had his nails done, you know, nice guy. But some of the harshest things, and we'll see this when we get into chapter 23, when Jesus when Jesus lit it up, he could light it up, all right? And so uh, we need to always remember that, that for all the grace that is there, Jesus, when people persist in wickedness, bind him hand and foot and take him away, cast him into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called, many are invited to come, but few are chosen. Why? because they refuse to come. When the Pharisees, then went the Pharisees and took counsel how they might entangle him in his talk. Now they're really mad. They're going to get into a debate with him. They're going to make him, they're going to, they think they're going to make him say something incriminating. All right? And, uh, and they sent out uh, unto him their disciples with the Herodians, saying, Master, we know that thou art true and teachest the way of God in truth. Neither carest thou for any man, uh, for thou regardest not the person of man. So in other words, we, we know, Jesus, that you don't play favoritism. We know that you are from God. We know that you're true. Your teaching is the truth. You are not intimidated by anybody, but you deal with everybody the same way. All right? You don't play favorites. So they butter him up, right? They're trying to catch him off guard, say nice things about him, butter him up, and then hit him with a trick question. Tell us, therefore, what thinkest thou? Is it lawful to give tribute unto Caesar or not? Right? This is a big question in the land of Israel at this time. The Romans ran the show. The Jews resented Romans running the show, all right? And they were always complaining that they had to pay exorbitant taxes to Caesar, all right? And everybody had an opinion about this, and most of those opinions, with the exception of a few, were negative, all right? And so, and everybody was alive to what anybody else would say. You did not want to be caught being sympathetic to the Romans, right? Nor did you want to get caught being sympathetic to the zealots, the terrorists of the day, all right? You didn't want to go either of those extremes. Uh, and so what they're doing here is they're trying to get Jesus to say something that will anger the crowds that are following him, all right? And, and, and if they can't do that, at least they'll make him say something, maybe get the Romans angry. So is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? But Jesus perceived their wickedness. And he said, why tempt ye me, ye hypocrites? Why are you putting me to the test, you play actors, you phonies? Show me the tribute money. And this is where Jesus wins, by the way. This is where he wins. He says, show me the tribute money. And one of these guys has to reach into his pocket and take out a Roman coin. 
thereby just by having it in his pocket and producing it, he admits that he is under the authority of Rome and uses Roman, is happy to use Roman money. You see what Jesus does? He says, show me the tribute money. And the minute that they do, Jesus has won. All right? Uh, and uh, so they brought unto him a penny, a denarius, a denarius. That was a, a coin that was equal to the average wages of a laborer for one day's work. All right? So a day's work. A penny. And he saith unto them, Whose image and superscription is this? All right? So he asked them, Whose picture is on here? And whose name is on here? And they say, Caesar's. So now Jesus could have simply turned and walked away victorious at that point because he got them to admit that they are under uh, tribute to Caesar uh, just by that action, right? So, but for the sake, for the sake of those in the crowd who need to understand, Jesus continues and he says, render therefore unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's and unto God the things that are God's. In other words, when government does what, is, what it is properly given by God to do, there is no conflict between loyalty to Caesar and loyalty to God. It is only, it is only when either the church steps into the sphere of the government and seeks to do what the church is not given to do. The church is given to preach the word of God and administer the sacraments and to, uh, and to uh, lead people in worship and service to the Lord. This is, what, this is what the church is given to do. The church is not given to rule temporal things, earthly things. Likewise, God gave human government in order to rule in the temporal sphere and not in the spiritual sphere. So as long as the government keeps its nose out of the church's business, there is no problem between serving God and serving Caesar. And this is what Jesus is pointing out. As long as everybody stays in their proper lane, what is proper to the church? What is proper to the state? As long as we stay in those lanes, there's no problem. The problem only comes when, as, as, the, uh, as the Pharisees and scribes were doing, plotting to murder Jesus, all right? This is a, this is a false, it's not given them to do any such thing like that. And so it is, when the government tells you to do something that God tells you to do otherwise, the government is to be disobeyed. The government has no right to make you do something against the will and word of God, all right? Now, the government used to understand this quite well, and we got along well for a long, long time. But now it seems that they love to not only do wrong, but make doing wrong the right thing and forcing you to go along with it and say you like it with a smile on your face. This is, this is modern leftism. It's not enough that they have their way. It's not enough that they, that they get their way. They have to make you accept it, and they have to make you grin and say you like it. And if you don't, you're a hater, all right? This is, this is the modern world. So things have changed 
across the fruited plain when it comes to trans Caesar transgressing his rights and his and what God has given him to do but what Jesus is saying here is that serving Caesar and serving God are not mutually exclusive things and so render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's and unto God the things that are God's when they had heard these words they marveled they couldn't believe it and uh, and they left him and went their way. Curses, foiled again, right? Snidely whiplash. Uh, the same day came to him the Sadducees, which say that there is no resurrection, and asked him, saying, Master, Moses said, now, here you see religious people who have no faith whatsoever and they do not believe that the Bible is the Word of God. And so their questioning is a, is a form of mockery of the whole idea of divine revelation. Uh, and so the Sadducees, they say there's no resurrection. Master, it is said that if a man die having no children, his brother shall marry his wife and raise up seed unto his brother. This is called the law of leverant marriage. It was practiced all throughout the Old Testament period where if, if uh, a, 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 a husband died without having any children, his brother had to go into his widow and get her pregnant so that the name of her dead husband could continue in the world and that her children would be provided for. I know it's kind of a squirrely thing, right? But, you know, it was, it was a practice in the Old Testament, and it was a practice that was designed to help people not fall into destitution, right? So, the law of leverate marriage. So, uh... <clears throat> So this guy dies, and having no issue, that's no children, he left his wife unto his brother. Likewise, the second also, and the third unto the seventh. So they make up a big, uh, a, a big what if, a big what if, and it's all, it's ridiculous what if, right? Because they think the whole thing is ridiculous anyway. So what if this could never happen in a million years thing actually happened what would you say to that jesus right last of all the woman died also all right now they're gonna they're gonna take a dig at the resurrection therefore in the resurrection whose wife shall she be of the seven for they all had her jesus answered and said unto them and this is like a little, eh. he says, ye do err, not knowing the scriptures, nor the power of God. You guys are clueless. That's what Jesus is saying. You don't know the scriptures, and you don't know the power of God, and therefore, it's not surprising that you are in error. For in the resurrection they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are as the angels of God in heaven. So marriage is a this-worldly thing. When you die and you go to heaven, you won't still be married in heaven to the person you were married to on earth, all right? Marriage is an institution for this life, not for eternity. So in the resurrection, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are as the angels of God. But as touching the resurrection of the dead, now, this thing about the resurrection of the dead that you're really making fun of, 
Have you not read that which was spoken by God unto you by God, saying, I am the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob? God is not the God of the dead, but of the living. So when God says this uh, in Exodus chapter 3, I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, he is saying that he is the God of the living, not the God of the dead. So though Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob were long dead when Moses heard these words from God in Exodus chapter 3, yet Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob still lived before God, all right? And when the multitude heard this, they were astonished at his doctrine. But when the Pharisees heard that he had put the Sadducees to silence, they were gathered together, and one of them, which was a lawyer, a lawyer in, in the Bible sense means an expert in the Mosaic law, uh, a, a theologian, a theologian. Uh, one of them, which was a lawyer, asked him a question, tempting him and saying, Master, which is the great commandment in the law? And Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. So, the whole Bible rests on these two commandments. Love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. So, in our catechism, when you study the catechism, the first three commandments have no other gods, don't take God's name in vain, and remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. These three commandments deal with our duty under God. All right? And then commandments 4 through 10, thou shalt not uh, thou, thou shalt honor thy father and thy mother, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness, thou shalt not covet. These all have to do with loving your neighbor as yourself. And so as there are two tables of stone, the first table is our duty to God and is summarized by the great commandment, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Then the, the second table of the law, commandments 4 through 10, is summarized by love your neighbor as yourself. All right? And, uh, and, and so all the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. Uh, so now, that, now this is interesting because this man, even though he's trying to trick Jesus, he asks an honest question, and Jesus gives him an honest, straightforward answer. All right? he's, not, he's not fiddling with Jesus, so Jesus doesn't fiddle with him. All right, uh, all right verse uh, 41. While the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them, saying, what think ye of Christ? Whose son is he? So now Jesus asks them a question. Whose son is Christ? And they say unto him, The son of David. And he saith unto them, How then doth David in spirit call him Lord, saying, The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou on my right hand till I make thine enemies a footstool. If David then calls him Lord, how is he his son? 
And no man was able to answer him a word, neither durst any man from that day forth ask him any more questions. So Jesus stumps them. So he, he, he says, let me ask you a question. He says, uh, what do you think about the Messiah? Whose son is he? And they say, right out, boom, the answer, like somebody who studied their catechism, son of David, right? Of course, he's the son of David. And Jesus says, okay, now, now Jesus here is being playful, but he is endeavoring to extend them far beyond where they've ever been extended before. So, he says, how then doth David in spirit call him Lord? How does David then, inspired by the Holy Ghost, to write the psalm, psalm we're dealing with Psalm 110, verse 1 here, all right? So David in spirit calls the Messiah his Lord. And he quotes it. The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou on my right hand till I make thine enemies thy footstool. So that's the scripture. David calling the, the Messiah his Lord. How is he his Lord and his son? If David then calls him Lord, how is he his son? And everybody was stumped utterly by this. The answer, of course, is the incarnation of the Son of God. According to his human nature, Jesus is the Son of David. But according to his divine nature, he is God Almighty. And these two natures are not left separate but they come together in the one person of Christ. So in the one person of Christ, you have the man who is almighty God. You don't have two natures kind of competing for, for action and attention. You have two natures in communion in one person and these two natures, wherever God is, man is, and wherever man is, God is. The incarnation of the Son of God. So the answer to Jesus' question is the incarnation, the God-man, that the Messiah is both God and man in one person. You see, that's the answer to this thing that Jesus said, which I think is kind of cool. You may not think it's that cool, but I think it's cool. All right, now, I'm going to prepare you for next week uh, because next week we're going to get into chapter 23. And in chapter 23, uh, the chickens come home to roost. Jesus is going to lay out the scribes and the Pharisees. All right, but let's just look at this first paragraph for a moment to get us ready for what we're going to hear next week. All right, then spake Jesus. Remember, now Jesus is in Jerusalem here on the days leading up to the Passover and his arrest, his crucifixion and death. All right, we are probably in Tuesday of Holy Week. All right, and uh, so then spake Jesus to the multitude and to his disciples, saying, the scribes and Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. Therefore, all whatsoever they bid you to observe, that observe and do. But do not ye after their works, for they say and they do not. They do not practice what they preach. They say and they do not. For they bind heavy burdens, grievous to be borne, and lay them on men's shoulders but they themselves will not move them with one of their fingers. But all their works they do for to be seen by men. They make broad their phylacteries and enlarge the borders of their garments. Oh, what's a phylactery? Yeah, 
it, it, it goes on the forehead or on the wrist and then there's a like a belt that goes wrapped up your arm and around your head and stuff like that and in this little leather pouch there are pieces of paper with scripture verses on in them and so whenever you wanted to say prayers you would put this these phylacteries on your on your arm and on your head between your eyes and that way you would always have God's word uppermost in, in your attention span, you see? So they may draw their phylacteries, in other words, they make really big ones, really ostentatious big ones, so that everybody will notice, I'm praying here, right? They may draw their phylacteries, and they enlarge the borders of their garments. Uh, they wore these tassels around the edges of their garments to distinguish them as Pharisees so that everybody would know that they were Pharisees and particularly holy people. So they'd make the fringes of their garments really ostentatious. All right? And they loved the uppermost rooms at feasts and the chief seats in the synagogues and greetings in the marketplace and to be called of men, Rabbi, Rabbi, and then Jesus says to his disciples, And you do not be called rabbi, for one is your master, even Christ, and all ye are brethren. This describes the Christian church. Nobody is in any position superior to anybody else except Christ. We are all brethren in the church. And call no man your father upon earth, for one is your father which is in heaven. A growing tendency in the modern church today, even in our Missouri Synod, is for Missouri Synod pastors to be called father this and father that. It's kind of cute. Uh, it's also cute when district presidents call themselves bishops, right? We do not have bishops in that way in the Missouri Synod. So when a Missouri Synod district president refers to himself as a bishop, he's being deceptive and dishonest because that is an inaccurate description of our polity. And, and, it's, and it's an amusing it's an amusing thing when pastors, the new thing is to be called father this and father that, and, and, uh, and, and there are all kinds of new modern little things that if you did them in the 1950s, you would have been booted out of town uh, and tarred and feathered, uh, it, and the Missouri Synod, your name would be uh, a hissing and a byword in the Missouri Synod. But now, these things are uh, just practiced with such glee and such, uh, such fun. Despite the fact that Jesus says here, don't you be called anybody's father. Do not call anyone your father, for you have one father, even God. All right, so there, we, that brings us up to where I want it to be for next week. So he, Jesus is just getting started, all right? He's just getting started. So let's say the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. All right, thank you for being here today. Oh,